Welcome to Modern Anarchy, the podcast featuring real conversations with conscious objectors to the status quo. I'm your host, Nicole. Hello, hello. On today's episode, we have performer, model, and director Lena Bembe join us for a conversation about our responsibility as ethical consumers to listen to the voices of porn performers. Together, we talk about performative sex stigma around sex work, and the politics of sexuality. Ooh, y'all, I feel like one of the biggest things I'm taking away from this conversation is, yes, what is our role as ethical consumers of porn? The reality is everyone watches porn. That is super normal. It's one of the biggest uses of the internet in general, and yet there are limited resources on where do you find ethical porn? How do you check to make sure that the producers are actually providing safe spaces for the performers and paying them adequately? I mean, there just wasn't even resources to find when I was trying to find links to learn more uh, for this episode. There just really wasn't a lot, which is so frustrating. And I think one of the biggest things that Lena talked about was it's our job as consumers to listen to the voices of the performers so that we can know who to support, so that we can be conscious consumers of our porn use. And I just want to shout that out to the universe that we really need to be conscious of what sites we're supporting and how can we do this in an ethical manner to make sure that the performers are safe. It's crazy that this is just one of the biggest things that the internet is used for and yet there lacks such an acknowledgement of the reality of the people who do this work. So I just really want to thank Lena for her time and being a voice that we can listen to on this podcast. And I also just want to say a big thank you to the Patreon community that supports and makes this podcast a reality each week. Y'all keep on the lights for me and keep me going in this movement of releasing an episode every week. So I just really want to say thank you. And if you've enjoyed the podcast and want to join the Anarchist family, then check out the Patreon link below. We're going to be having our March Q&A. So keep sending in your questions. I'm a sex coach. I study clinical psychology. Use me. Send in your questions and I will be answering them for this month's Q&A and releasing that bonus episode on the Patreon. So check out the links below and all of the pledges from this month are continuing to support the Brave Space Alliance, which is a trans, black-led, LGBTQ site that provides mental health services on the south side of Chicago. So if y'all want to join the community, want to get that bonus episode and support something larger than ourselves and be a part of the radical change that we want to see in the world, then check out the Patreon link below. Otherwise, I hope y'all really enjoy this conversation with Lena and tune in. Where are you at? Are you are you in the States or... Uh, I am in Berlin. Okay, yes, yeah. In Berlin, Germany. It's 5 p.m. over here. Oh, wow. Yeah, I literally so, yeah. just woke up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 10 good a.m. Morning. In the yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, good evening to you. How's your day going? Uh, it's been quite busy. I am working on a deadline. I'm writing a piece for days. And I'm also in the middle of, like, next week I'm shooting and directing a music video. So I am have a lot of work, actually. <laughs> nice. So what do you do? Yeah, what do you do? I mean, like, for me, I'm a, I'm a porn performer. And, like, I mean, pornography, experience, sexuality, it's my thing. Uh, it just came about someone who um, is acquainted with my work. She happens to be a musician, and then she was like, "Hey, I would like, I would like you to do this music video for this track that I have." And I was to listen to it, and I was like, "Okay, that sounds good, and I can just, yeah, do it, basically." Yeah. Um, Why not? Why not? You have many skills. Yeah, I mean, it's another way of just, I don't know, like doing what you do and yeah. doing your thing and then just having like a nice project to put it in and also 
the budget for it because we, as usual, like the money and creating films and so on, it's expensive, can be expensive. So it's it's nice to have some funding to do nice things here and there. You have that creative mm-hmm. outlet. Yeah, that's super exciting. Wow. It sounds like you have a lot of different aspects of your creativity going, right? Writing, filming, the porn, all these different pieces that you get to like dabble in all aspects of your artistry and creative nature. I mean, it's, I think in many ways it's all, it's all tied together. Uh, the connecting thread on it for me, it's, it's all about explicit sexuality uh like my main thing and to me what i like the most is uh, is being in front of a camera and for this reason i have been doing porn for so long and so on and that's what i'm known for but i mean every now and then like i do get also like writing i get to write pieces you know and i get to uh sometimes like speak about sex and so on but yeah from my experience it's mostly and what i like the most is like film and I'm performing. It's um, it's my thing. Let's just say. Hell yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I can feel from the way that you're talking about it and your presence that it's something that you're very passionate about. Could you tell me how you got into this? Not everyone just like wakes up doing this sort of work. I'd love to hear uh, your journey into this field and this work. Uh, well, it's it was just like a very funny thing. I mean, I don't think that it's like the most typical thing to just to decide that one day you want to do it. You want to become a porn performer or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, it was just like a point which once I was like established here in Berlin, I saw that the access to pornography, that it's like, to alternative pornographies, it's like very much there, you know. It was like very easy to attend, for example, the Porn Film Festival in Berlin that has been running for over I don't know, 16 or 17 years already. And I think that was like my first like point of con- contact with porn that it's like be- beyond just like what you watch alone in your computer. And it was just something that seemed very, that I felt like very connected to from the very beginning. And then I felt like, oh my God, like this mm. is something I could totally be doing. And I just felt really yeah. very curious and I'm very attracted to so after like going to uh, to attending the festival and so on and watching a few screenings, I decided to just get in touch with a couple of directors. And on both occasions, I like met with them in person. Uh, they told me about what they do, how they work, what what's their film, what's their process, and so on. Gave me a couple of tips about entering this industry. And with one of them, it happened that maybe like a month. Or, or so later, I was I was shooting with her. Wow! And wow. after that, my very first year was very um, was very slow. I took it really easy. I didn't do much films and so on. I didn't like put myself forward like that with that much intensity, and it helped me to very much um, check in with myself, you know, about how comfortable I was about this, how sure I was about this, and then yeah. it turned out that I was feeling good about it so then the year after I just went in into it with a little bit more uh, consistency and that one that happened what was that six years ago yeah yeah that was six years ago Wow. And I love this, this checking in with yourself constantly, right? Like, does this suit me? Does this like, is this in alignment with myself and having that space and you, yes, taking up that space and Mm -hmm. saying, yes, I like this and this is what I want to do. And I feel confident in that. Yeah. I think that most of this is because, I mean, this is like sex work Mm -hmm. first and foremost. And in so many ways, and when you decide to do, uh, when you jump into, I mean, like, it, it comes with its risks. Like, every single, like, type of sex work has, like, entails a good number of risks. Like, yeah, and whenever you choose to jump into it, it's something that is not, like, it's not an adventure. It, it can be very complex. It can be very difficult, you know. There are, like, some risks attached to it. And when it comes to online sex work, it's the fact that, what you do can potentially, I mean, def, what you have no control. 
once your mm -hmm. image is put online, you have no control of it. You don't know exactly where it's going to end up. And, and that's something that you really have to consider because of all the stigma that it's attached to sex work, to be, to doing porn, the, I don't know, the jobs that you might lose, the relationships in your life that you might jeopardize, you know. And I don't know, there are like many difficult stories when it comes to being in pornography and how, when it comes to being a sex worker, the risks of being outed, you know. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, like, if you if you get to do this, like even if it's just once in your lifetime, you really have to think about it very, very, very well because mm. it's a complex decision. It's not something just for like sits and giggles or anything. Like right, that, yeah. exactly. And how difficult to have something that resonates so deeply with your own value system and how you want to show up with the world, but knowing that thing that is so authentic to you can also risk so many relationships, jobs, all these other things, right? And you're just caught in such a pole here of what feels clear and true to you and society is telling you the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Ugh. Yeah, how did you feel sitting with that weight when you first started? I mean, I think that because like my very first approach to it was very much based on a gut feeling, you know, mm -hmm. I... Um, I did it, and I was like, okay, this feels right. But then there was, like, something inside of me. Also, because I, I did have, like, I mean, like, the people that I approached, they were also, like, knowing that this was my first time, they were also quite, I mean, they, they gave me information, you know? So they were also gave me, like, some things to think about, not only, like, for myself, like, right now, but also, like, some potential things that I will have to consider in the future, you know? So that was, like, very useful. And I think that after, like, doing this, like, out of, as a 100% intuitive move, then I decided to, I was like, okay, you follow your gut. Now it's time to put it in rational terms, you know, to, yeah. to have like both sides, put like the both like intuitive and rational sides like in conversation and then like uh, reflecting on what I did and what happened. And, and yeah, and yeah, and if this was like a right decision, so. Oh, yeah, and that's how I approached it, and I also I didn't like rush to continue shooting them stuff, so that helped me a lot, and and yeah, and it turned out to be, at least for my process, it turned out to be the right thing to do. And I love that, right? I love that so much, and this takes such a strong connection to yourself. This is something I'm hearing over and over again, right? And like, this is something with any path of authenticity that is outside of societal norms, right? It takes this deep, deep sense of truth internally to say, no, this is what I believe in and this is what I'm going to stand for and this is the future that I want to create. Yes, yes. So then tell me, I'm thinking like you're going into your first scene, right, shooting. What was going through your head at that time? Were you feeling super confident like from the bat, like I got this? And I was so damn nervous that day, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, for, luckily, like that on that time, uh, the director that I worked with by, back then, she was also shooting a scene the day before. And she invited me over. She was like, hey, do you want to come over to see how it's done, blah, 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 so that you can have like um, an idea. And I was like, yes, thank you for that. So, so yeah, I was able to to see how they went about it and so on. It was also a very um, quite a DIY production, you know. So it was like not sure, like sure. it wasn't like a set. It wasn't like a big crew or anything like that. It was like quite yeah, quite small. So in that sense, it helped me out to just like be around, you know, to check it out, to have a little bit more like conversations like afterwards with the people involved in it. So that was like reassuring, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, but the day after, of course, I was like crazy. I was so so nervous, but but yeah, once I was there, and um, once I was about to get into it, I was like, okay, like here we go, and then and then the rest went good. The rest was was good. I felt comfortable. I felt good being oh, yeah. from the camera. The performer that I was like uh, doing it with, like he was. I mean, he had more experience, you know, and it was like someone like I felt comfortable working with. So that was that was good. And yeah, so we're the end of the way, I was like, okay, this is, this, this is so fun. This, this, this kid. Hell yeah. And so 
so yeah, uh, in that sense, uh, I think it was just like a mixture of emotions and of course a typical nervousness about like being doing it for the first time. And then of course you want to do it right, you know, you, uh, yeah. you want to see, I mean, of course, I don't know, like having a camera in front of you, it's like, okay, what am I going to give to the camera? You know, like, how am I going to? So there's like a lot of questions that come into it, a lot of like um, ideas, you know, and I don't know, lots of like voices in your mind. But then at the end of the day, it's like, okay, like, it's time to jump into it. So let's just, let's just do it and try not to think too much about it. Right, right, right. I mean, I'm thinking about like my own sexual experiences, right? There's a million different things running through my head of, and I, you know, I'm trying to work on that of just breathing, being present in my body, not being so much in my head, but I can't even imagine shooting a scene where then it's like, oh, and I need to move my body this way. So the camera sees this angle and I need to be here. And it's like, God, I feel like that would pull you out of the present moment of the interaction. And that has to be such a difficult balance here of like, enjoying the sexual intimacy that you're building in that scene right and also remembering that it is a scene and you have to move your body in certain ways for a camera mm -hmm. I, I think in that sense like that's what makes being a performer something complex and something that not yeah. everyone can just do just because they think oh it's just, it's just sex in front of the not really like no. having a camera in front of you uh it's it's a different kind of thing of course like all sex is performative you know but uh, the kind of dimension, and even like in the in the in the narratives that seem to be that are more like oriented towards like oh natural sex or like way it is and realistic and so on, every single like scene that you shoot like that you have when you have a camera in front of you, it does change the way in which you perform. And and in that sense, like it's important, you know, to know like the technical aspects of it, or know exactly how to move yourself in front of the camera, how to conduct yourself in front of the camera. And because this is like first and foremost like a form of work, I think in some ways it's not even like necessary, you know, to have like. Of course, it's always nice and good and fun if you experience like real sexual pleasure, or if you have like chemistry with the people you work with. But it's not something that it's, it's not a requisite, you know? So in some occasions it's okay, it's to, it's okay to feel pleasure and it's nice, but it's not, it's not part of your job, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah, also more. good because as a performer, you don't have to, you don't have to, um, it's just like this extra layer that becomes too demanding is that every single time, like every single person you're made to work with, you have to like them and you have to enjoy them and you have to, be into them and it's like I don't know sometimes you just like have to work with people that you don't feel attracted to and that's just fine and sometimes you have like uh, work with people that you don't feel like any sort of like chemistry even if you try and that's okay you know and it's 100% fine just to fake pleasure it's 100% fine just to fake your orgasm and I think in that sense what you sh like what I try to focus the most is just like in giving the performance that I am um, that I want to give or that like the the type of scene is demanding. That's that's more important than coming for real or liking the people you're doing it with. Mm. Um, it's it's part of the job, you know? Yeah, interesting. That's such a different way than I would have thought like this concept of faking orgasm or these other pieces of like that intimacy where I would I would feel like the desire would be to want to be like authentic and true and fully present could you say more mm -hmm. about yeah that that push and pull of the performance versus the authenticity of it well I think that performance and authenticity are not against each other sure because I yeah. think that with or without a camera in front of us, we all perform sex, yeah. you know? Yes, yes, uh, yes. So in that sense, and something that I sometimes observe when I, like, when on social media, you know, when people are like, oh, performative sex, you know, uh, like as if, as if you're doing it wrong, you know? It's like, okay, so we all perform, you know? We all, like, yeah. have sex according to certain, like, codes you know mm -hmm. and we all are also in a way in which we stand against like certain normative codes we also sure. perform you know no one is free from performing you know and and it's and it's really funny because sometimes people when they criticize like certain types of pornography they talk about oh like, but they show performative sex right it's like performative sex what are you talking you know it's like 
I don't know, heterocentric narrative. Because that's, if that's what you mean, then yeah, but like the people that you are watching in like the queer porn that you feel represented in, it's also performative, you know? People, I don't know, like performers, we don't have, it's not like the, the sex that we do have in porn films is exactly the same kind of sex that we have in our private life. Mm, uh, interesting. I mean, that that's yeah. not always the case, you know? Yeah. And, and that's fine because I mean if you want to keep private like your taste in bed or like how much or your sexual appetites that should be you you, you should have the right you know to keep it private on the one hand and on the other because this is like a this is like a job like you're not like obliged to disclose those things you know yeah in this sense yeah. it's, it will be like demanding like emotional a sort of emotional labor that that perhaps you don't demand from other jobs you know? Yes. Because yes. we're talking about like, I don't know, like, off, like, I don't know, let's say like a typical boring office job that people do like to pay the bills and get by. You don't, you don't expect at least uh, on paper, you know, to demand emotional labor from that, you know? Mm-hmm, so that should be mm-hmm. like the same standard that you should hold like sex workers for, you know? And I think that in some ways, the better the working conditions, the less people are demanded to perform that way. It's like, okay, you come to do your job, you perform the way in which we are, like, asking you to perform, and then that's it. You don't need to give, like, anything extra. You don't need to bury your soul. You don't need to develop some emotional connection. You just, like, go get in front of the camera, fuck, fuck the way you are, uh, you agree to fuck it, make it look nice, and... Go home and yeah. cash your money. Yes, and, that, and that's, yes. that's that's the way it should be. Mm. Of course, like this sounds like too cold and so on, but there's definitely ways of like doing it and showing it in a fun, appealing way. Yeah, I'm so interested when you said "fuck the way that you like agreed that you would for the scene." Like, could you tell me more about what those dialogues are like before you go into a scene? How do you make these agreements with the producers of how you're going to show up in this space? Um, I mean, there are different ways. I think it, it some, in many ways, like it depends on the size of production, how it sure. is done, and so on. But definitely, 100, percent this is something that needs to be agreed on beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. Because, of course, you're not going to, you're not so like, oh, yeah, you know, it's going to be like this lesbian scene. And then you just like show on set and then it's like, oh, guess what? It's a gangbang. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would yeah, be yeah. really. <laughs> so, of course, like in that sense, like it's it's expected, you know, because first of all, you need to see if this is something that we've seen your range of uh, skills and what you normally do. Uh, second, because that also uh, determines the fee that you are receiving, because of course, like, I don't For know. sure. Yeah, if you're going to do an orgy, it's not the same as doing solo masturbation scene, you know? Like sure. It's, you have to price it accordingly. You have to prepare yourself accordingly. Uh, so in many ways, you, it, it is very... It is the right way, and and I think I have never been in a in a in a set where I haven't been told beforehand what the deal is gonna be. You were told, you know, like uh, what is expected from you if you accept to it. Any potential details, you know. Uh, you're also asked about. You should be asked about your boundaries, you know. Mm, I love that. Yep. And also, you should be attentive to the co-performers' boundaries as well. And, and yeah, like all the, all the details, of course, it's also super important, you know, who you perform with because it's also natural and it should be also respected the fact that many people do have their no lists or people with whom they do not wish to perform for several reasons. Uh, so those, those things are mostly discussed also in terms of safer sex and so on. It's also if you need barrier protection or if you need, uh, any other props and so on, it's also, that's also like discussed beforehand and should be discussed beforehand. So, so yeah, there's like many elements here and there. Of course, also like STI testing protocols are discussed like these days also with COVID, uh, there's like, pro- there are protocols in place. And 
Uh, yeah, so, I mean, like, and every single detail that you can think of from sexual health to fees to shoot partners to uh, to the kind of sex that you're going to have and so on should be discussed and should be agreed upon and also should not be last changed last minute, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, without, or even without consulting, you know? Yes, yes. And I love that, that discussion of consent, boundaries, right? Making sure that everyone feels safe in the scene and how many people would benefit just from even applying these ideas to their own sex mm-hmm. life, you know, with whoever they're having sex with, right? Like, we should be discussing these things. What are you looking for? What are you wanting? It's not, it's okay to talk about these things before you start. Of course. Yes, yes, that's that's precisely the point. Exactly. And I'm thinking like, you know, from before you started working as a porn performer to having this first encounter, I mean, that's a whole identity shift, right? So then you come out of that scene and now now you are a porn performer. Do you feel like that changed maybe how you interacted with the world, how you interacted in your private sex life? I mean, that's that's a whole big identity shift. You mean as in like from one day saying, okay, now I'm a porn performer and so on. Okay. Yes. It's, it's, it's quite something. Yes. And it's mostly because of the stigma attached to pornography and all yeah. sex work of all types, you know? Yeah, it's it's a process. I will have to say that it's not something that just like appears like and you just like realize uh, at once and then you just you have like the full picture right away. It does, it does become a process, and I think the first time I was like, oh my god, like when I left like that first time that I did my first film, I was like, oh my god, I, 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 yes. I just did porn. Yep, And it's yep. just like, eh, eh. and then there's like, perhaps like, at least in my case, I wasn't like much thought about it. I think I was just like, kind of like sitting with the different emotions, you know, sure, sitting sure. in the moment with it. And then over time, I think also with experiences that you have and with the paths that you like, go through that I think that 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 actually shapes the way in which you assume yourself as a porn performer and as a sex worker Uh, I don't think there's like a single way of in which a porn performer like define themselves because of course there's like a silly and silly different experiences of doing porn and existing in this industry and navigating it because it's so damn complicated so I think that prob- definitely what I thought about this industry when I was in my first years, it has like changed and evolved and become more mature compared to how I feel and what I think is based and also how my career has changed so far. So in def- definitely like this is in so many ways in which you assume like different identities about yourself that it's always like in constant change and evolution yes. and so on. Yes. That's yes. the way it happens with with being a porn performer, and it's definitely shaped by the circumstances and the conditions with which you uh, move along with your work. You know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The shift as you get further into it, it's changing how you relate to it, how you see yourself in it. Yes. Yes. Hundred percent. Yeah. Could you say more about that? What is that evolution, or or maybe more so, where are you at currently with it? Okay, I think that definitely in the beginning, I was the, I was taught because this is something that I chose to do yeah. in a very conscious way, and um, I I think definitely like my first years were like more. I was definitely like super enthusiastic. You know, I was like really yeah, eager. You know, to sure. continue moving doing things and moving along it and so on. So definitely I did have lots of enthusiasm, you know, and and of course like your first experiences are, I mean, I don't know, I think that in so many ways like nothing really prepares you to be a porn performer, you know, so there's like a lot of information that yes. you are missing as well when it yes. comes to working conditions, you know, about like, what things should you accept or what things like maybe you should say no to and so on. So, of course, there is, like, some things that you only learn through with experience, you know? I yeah. do think that right now, compared to the beginning, it's definitely my view of the porn niche that I exist in. It's it's far more complex. I think I'm more, like, aware of the complexities of doing this. I still very much like what I do, and I still love to shoot and so on. 
but at the same time, I, I am fully aware of what sort of complexities come with it. I have become a little bit more uh, selective about certain projects that I do. Uh, but of course, I still like a lot of things. I feel more at ease with doing things that are working in narratives that maybe don't appeal to me on a personal level, but it's like, okay, like this is uh, just like a bang for the buck, so to speak. Yeah. So this is just, this will pay my, this will pay my bills and that's, and that's just fine. I think that in some ways I have, yeah, as I said, I have like a better understanding of like how complex this can be, but how like this industry <laughs> is not like the love and light idea that I had in the First beginning, had, you yeah, know, about, yeah. I still have like days that are like very good, you know, and I feel, I'm like feel happy about the path that I have carved for myself and the, and the way in which my work is regarded, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that's something that I feel like very happy about and also about like certain choices when it comes to how to move through, you know, mm, in, this, yeah. in many ways, like this industry, it's very, it's very, very precarious. It's very difficult to navigate, uh, when, especially when it comes to performers that uh, work or that like, present themselves as female. It's it's quite easy to have like a shelf life, you know, because like this industry really? is always like looking for fresh faces and so on. So there's also oh. a point in which like you have to uh, readjust yourself and what you do and um, oh wow and so uh, so I mean I don't know in some ways like this industry also I do have like better understanding that this industry does require a lot of. Uh, an entrepreneurial attitude, you know, mm -hmm. about like mm -hmm. having to do things yourself and not waiting for others to kind of like invite you over and so on. Like in the, in the beginning for me, I had like the fortune of being able to offer like a good amount of work studio and so on. And then at some point like that, due to different factors that has like slowed down. And it's like, okay, now it's time for me to learn that to what extent you have to look and procure things for yourself. So, so yeah, in many ways, it has been like a little bit of like my path and like the things that I have uh, learned along the way. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love that you're bringing this full honesty to it, right? Sometimes people just want to say, yeah, the work that I do is great and it's perfect and it's always awesome. And I think that sometimes that misses the mark of the reality of we can have these passions that we are so dedicated to and still there's aspects of it that aren't great. Like that is real life, right? Mm -hmm. There are ups and downs yeah. to all of this and it's not, there's nothing wrong with saying some of this stuff is shitty, right? And I'm still passionate about it and I still love what I do. Yeah, I think that in the case of porn work and sex work, I think this is also something really important to to highlight, which is the fact that because of the stigma that is attached to our work, you know, it is very old, it is very difficult to communicate when conditions are where conditions are difficult, you know, yeah. or to advocate for uh, or to call out things that should be called out, you know, or to talk about injustices without being uh, judged for them. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think that when it comes to porn work and so on, the ways the ways in which the industry can work, it's it's difficult to access that uh, kind of information, you know. Yeah. And when you are a sex worker and talk about like instances in which you have been mistreated or abused and so on, people mm. are some people are very quick to judge you for it and to tell you in your face that you had it coming because it shows like Jesus. this type of work. And sometimes, like, even just, like, censorship in social media and stuff, you cannot, like, pose, do a pose Anything. without putting, like, the word, like, sex in it or porn in it or sex work without you getting, like, a shadow ban or censor yeah. or having your account uh, cancel and so on. So it is, uh, I think many people are really eager to talk about how is it like to work and exist in this industry in its full complexity, but in some ways it's so... It's so difficult to do it because of how stigmatized our work is, mm -hmm. about how, how like heavy censorship on us, and about also like the potential side effects of doing yes. so, like people yes. pointing at you or like blaming you for things, or even like giving you a reputation of being like difficult or a troublemaker. Uh, so yeah, so it, it is complicated. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that victim blaming narrative that you got into this field, what did you expect? And it's like, no, we need protection in this field. We don't, I'm sure there's no union, you know, that's advocating for these rights for the workers within this field. I mean, and that's a huge problem that there's not protection for something that is one of the hugest things on the internet that people spend their time doing. Like people are just suppressing these conversations, acting like no one does this. There's no need to have a protection for the laborers in this market. And it's just absolutely insane that we hush all this down when there are real people in this field that need protection and need the rights to feel safe. Ugh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure in that then, you know, so much of your work probably feels like a political statement. I mean, what you said of being a troublemaker, right? Having that view or other people having that view of you. I mean, yeah, it's kind of way. I mean, if we're talking about sex and the ways in which sex is political, definitely pornography and sex work add to it's It's highly, highly political, you know. It is not only in the way in which you put, like, it's not only present, you know, in the images, aesthetics, and narratives in films. It's also present in the way in which the industry operates, you know, and it's also present in which, in the in the way in which, like, the lives of uh, people, sex workers, they live their lives and get through their own struggles, you know. So, I mean, this industry is it's intensely political, you know. Even if you whether you go about it in explicit like explicitly or whether you just like move through it it's like it's it's very linked to politics absolutely right and then yeah and this is a part of your identity and kind of what you said earlier of once you put that image out it's out there right so now people can see that aspect of you and there is no quote unquote hiding of that so that is such a political statement to say this is who i am and i don't have shame for what i do here in fact i'm proud mm -hmm. of what i do here and i'm fighting for a better future for all sex workers to have more you know space to discuss and be safe in these spaces and have their rights that's amazing yes yes yeah, and it probably doesn't also always feel amazing, right? That's the that's the heaviness of it, that what you're doing is fighting against a whole patriarchal system that has hushed all conversations about sex, and so you are fighting against a huge wave of just shame and constriction around sexuality, which is not an mm -hmm. easy task. Yeah, I think that sometimes it just comes like the wish of like, oh my god, like, I wish like... I wish we didn't have to deal with this, you know. I wish, like, even sometimes I wish, like, this wasn't a political matter, but this is not something that you choose to. Yeah. This is just the way it is. And yes. when good things happen, it feels amazing, but when things are difficult, it's really overwhelming and yeah. disheartening. Uh, of course. And then there's how many people can understand what you're going through, right? And like your experience. I'm sure other sex workers do, but then the massive public, when you're trying to explain these stories and what you're going through, they just, I'm sure, don't understand. I mean, it's it's an effort of advo it's proper advocacy and proper education. It, it, yeah, like that. that's very much what you end up doing, but it's so worth it because I think also... It's, it can also be like a highly rewarding thing, you know, to have like these sorts of like conversations, you know, with people who have potentially never had a conversation, a candid conversation about like porn or sex and sexuality and all those things. So in so many ways, like sometimes it can be like actually nice, you know, because yeah. people do, many people do need to have like spaces for these kind of conversations that they don't have access to. And these sorts of like spaces and so on can also help people to understand themselves, you know? It's like some sort of like collective growth, so to speak, because then for ourselves, we do like have a little bit more understanding. It helps towards destigmatizing what we do. It helps towards demystifying what we do and the health and success about the porn industry and so on. And at the same time, for people, they do get to understand themselves, their own sexuality and so on. So. It's always like this kind of like win-win situation when things are, are good. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, there's really high highs and potentially low lows, but mm -hmm. that is also life with anything, right? Yes. Exactly. Yes. What 
future do you hope to see within sexuality and the porn industry? I mean, within the porn industry, definitely something that is really heavy these days is uh, censorship. So I think that uh, I like these days in more of pragmatic terms, censorship is one of the heaviest things that we're going through. Yeah. Because that censorship also contributes towards like progressive criminalization of what we do. Yep. Yep. And of give an, of porn, but also like different types of sex work and so on. So it like contributes towards further marginalization, you know, yeah. of uh, sex work, sex workers in our lives, you know. So yeah, I just wish to have a future in which like all types of sex work stop being um, stigmatized, criminalized, yeah. marginalized, prosecuted, and in which, yeah, we just get to do our thing with more, with more safety, you know, with more protections, with more, with rights, yes. with better rights, you know, and in that, in that way, we just, like, get to go about our lives without, like, all this harassment that we, that we get, you know, so I think that if there's something that I wish, that it's all that basically like all the injustices that we face to be lifted and just be left alone you know <laughs> yeah. do everything in peace and that's all of course yeah and I want to say thank you for doing that work you know like you are a part of making that future every time you step into that space and every time you bring your authentic self and your voice out and speak for the future that you want, you're making that happen, even if it's just that ripple, right? Yes. Well, I, I, I hope to. I think we all hope to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For the listeners who might not, you know, this is the first time they're hearing these things, was not previously aware of these levels of complexities. Is there anything that you would refer them to doing or reading or learning more about so that they can fully get this picture of what's going on within the porn industry? Mm -hmm. I think that there's like, there's not like a single way to go about sure. it. And sure. I think there's also like many different people have like many different tastes of porn. And there is not a single porn industry. There is like a multiplicity of porn industries and niches. So um, I think that the most important bit uh, to do is to, if you watch porn, if you're curious about porn, if you like certain kind of porn, I think it's always important to focus and follow the voices of the performers you see, uh, you see in any type of porn that you may like. I, I think it's very common for us, the people who do porn, to be like very open and vocal, you know, about how this industry works, you know, about the conditions in which we work with and so on. So definitely, in many ways, either consciously or more indirectly, like sex workers, porn performers can offer a lot of educational insight to people who watch porn or even if they don't like it, for people to understand what it is, you know, we can stop like buying into the typical cliches about what porn is and not. And I think that in that way, like, people can also have a little bit more of an insight of uh, how the industry works, uh, getting, like, recommended recommendations of, like, companies or platforms or narratives or clip stores, you know, of, of pornography that could be of their liking, you know, and having also a little bit more uh, of an insight of how the porn industry works about if if it's like if that cliche about like the poor industry so it's a million it's a multi-million dollar industry it's like yeah but for whom exactly. for how many people you know how does it work for like the common like person who's like uh your webcam the, the web your web camera or the people who's like do, the person who's doing like content in their clip store you know what is the extent of watching i don't know porn films that have been raped and just like uploaded by i don't know who on on tube sites, you know, what what is the extent of how important it is, for example, for performers, for performers to have like their, their work supported, you know, or like for, I don't know, or paying for pornography, if that's yes. the deal, you know. 
So yes. in some other ways, like the very first like, stepping stone to get more acquainted with how the industry works is definitely to hear to hear it firsthand from porn performers. Mm-hmm. Uh, because in some other ways, like within the porn industry, the porn performers are the sex workers uh, within the industry. And we are the people who are the most vulnerable yeah. to stigma, to abuse, to so many things. All so it, definitely yeah. like... In the same way, if we're discussing like workers' rights, you will then go and ask the owner of the factory what is it like about like ethics and working conditions. You will go like to the workers themselves to ask them what is it like to work there and how you can support them. It's the same story with performers. Exactly, exactly. And so many people now are taking the stance where they really want to ensure that their companies are ethical in the way that they treat their employees and their manufacturing, right? This is a big movement where we're wanting to know that information to be conscious Mm -hmm. consumers. And I think people really need to take that same level of integration into their porn use, right? And consumption is like, who are you supporting? What are the performers saying about that work? And that, you know, how can you do this consciously in a way that is aware of these larger things you're discussing and so mm-hmm. yeah I'm so thankful that you've been on this space to share your experience right exactly what you're saying is listen to the performers in the space what are they saying yes exactly yeah is there anything else that you feel like before you came into this conversation you really wanted to touch on today and use the space to discuss well, I think that uh, if there was anything it was, it was actually like this very last a question that we discussed, you know, was how important it is to focus on performance themselves and what is the role that we play in this, like, whole, like, industry game and so on. And also, I think that maybe just, like, could make a recommendation for people about how important it is to educate ourselves when it comes to what is porn, what is not, what pornography is not, how, like, the industry can work, you know, and what does it mean to performers? And also, what is the uh, weight of uh, censorship? Like, yeah. for example, right now, like, there are, like, some, like, very important legislation going on in the, U- in the U.S. And if it passes, it's called the Earn It Act. It could be, it could be really, like, harmful, not only for sex workers and for criminalized, like, uh, even more, like, life and the privacy of sex workers. I think also, like, laws like this, like, they do mess with questions of, like, privacy, you know, that they start first with sex workers, but then they just, again, it becomes, like, the excuse, you know, to extend to other areas of, like, uh, people's lives and privacy and, like, the safety of, like, activists and anyone who is, like, deemed the enemy of the state, quote-unquote, you know. So I think that for these reasons, it's not only about, like, you know, how the industry works. It's also because, like, when questions of, like, legislation and censorship, whether it's, like, governmental or corporate, they also involve, like, they also eventually involve the population at large, you know. So, yes. I mean, getting informed about these things, it's, it's, it's crucial for everyone. Exactly. Yes. And that, I mean, and I'm so thankful that you're bringing this conversation to light. And I hope people take, you know, this conversation and grow from here. How can we help support, you know, and fight that legislation? Because this is an actively, this is an active thing going on right now that we need to Mm -hmm. fight back on. I mean, and this is going to shape our future. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. All right, I have one closing question that I ask everyone uh-huh. on the podcast. It's, what is one thing that you wish other people knew was more normal? Well, I think that the fact that we all have weird sexual fantasies. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. And, and it's okay to portray them as fantasies, you know, in, in film. Of course, I, I will put, like, certain, like, boundaries into that because this is not just, like, something that it goes without limits. But but I think that this is one of the biggest, is also one of the biggest misunderstandings of pornography, that people cannot tell reality from fantasy, you know? Mm-hmm. Or that people do get scared, you know, of things that seem a bit too perverted about, like, what, how, how come they can inhabit the, the minds of, like, certain people. I think that that's just, like, the centuries of, like, Christianity uh, reinforcing the way in our minds and in our own ways of, like, self-policing ourselves. But 
I don't know. I think that, that we were just like more like aware with that because that could also like really help us to shape, yeah, like porn, how it's done and to address like uh, the problematic points of the industry or like the, or the narratives that dominate the, the industry. Absolutely, right? And I mean, bringing it back to what you discussed earlier, this whole piece of consent, boundaries, discussions, if you have two consenting adults, do whatever you want, right? Like, why do we put these hinges? That, But I mean, that first piece, I think, is what's important. Two consenting adults that feel safe, feel like they can define their scene, their fantasy, do whatever they want, then have fun, play, go mm -hmm. at it. You know what I mean? Why, we restrict ourselves so much, it hurts. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, it was so great to have you. I really appreciate you Thank coming you on the so podcast. Much. Yeah, and just bringing your full self and your whole story. It's been, yeah, just great to learn from you and your experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been fun having you. Yeah, this good. Is there anywhere if you want to refer people to resources, your work that you'd want to plug now? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think most of my work is on my, uh, it's advertised on my uh, social media accounts. It's all like at Lina Bembe. Uh, it's a, either on Instagram or Twitter, and both of them I have a link tree with links to uh, my work, to platforms where I have my work hosted, and in that sense, like all my 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 the links to my platforms, they all have uh, affiliate links. So if you also if you're curious enough, I would super appreciate that people like check out and if, and pay for their porn like from those affiliate links because that also helps a lot uh, performers with with getting like some extra money and, oh, yeah. and yeah like anything that you want to check out it's definitely that's where I exist the most like social media twitter and instagram i do have an only fans as well uh onlyfans.com lena bembe and and yeah that's that's where everyone can can see what i've been up to and what else i have for everyone. hell yeah. yes Hell yes. Keep doing your badass work, okay? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, then leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you're a part of the anarchist community, then follow us on Instagram or nominate a guest for the show by sending in a letter to modernanarchypodcast at gmail.com. Otherwise, I'll see you next week.